Welcome to Sense and Sensibility, the Inflation Guy podcast. I am Michael Ashton. I am the Inflation Guy, and I am your host, and I am talking about the CPI report today and my perceptions of it. This uh, this report today played to form kind of what we were expecting, and by that I mean it wasn't as good as the last two prior months, which uh, we knew had been influenced by unusual things. But before I get into that, a word from our sponsor and the trivia question. This episode of Sense and Sensibility is sponsored by Simplify ETFs, a fast-growing ETF shop democratizing access to the most sophisticated alternative strategies. With diversifying strategies like market neutral equity long short, managed futures, and multi-strat quant, Simplify has a suite of compelling tools to help address the biggest concerns with the classic 60-40 portfolio. Check out their website at simplify.us and you can find their entire lineup of ETFs at simplify.us slash ETFs. Uh, and now the, uh, the trivia question. Uh, what supposedly happens, what supposedly results from playing the phrase number nine on the White Album's composition, Revolution 9, backwards. So if you have that composition, Revolution 9, and, and the part where they go number 9, number 9, what supposedly happens if you play that backwards? Okay. Does that sound esoteric enough? Is that weird? Some people, some of you will know the answer instantly, and others will say, what kind of question is that? So that makes it a good trivia question. All right, so going into today's figure, let's uh, set the backdrop, um, you know, from the last couple of months, um, because that's what makes what makes this number interesting is not this number; it's actually what where we had been the last couple of months, and uh, because we we'd had two very low core prints over the last uh, uh, over Ju- um, July and the July and June prints from the July or from the August and July reports. Okay. So today was the August report reporting in September, <clears throat> but the, uh, but the CPI for August. Um, and so the, uh, the, the June one that was released in July was, was a very low print, uh, sub 0.2 and, um, and, uh, and a surprise, and and quite quite a big surprise. Um, looking at it, it was uh, a lot of it was airfares. Air, airfares had fallen eight percent. Lodging away from home had fallen two percent, um, and um, and wireless um, wireless telephones had fallen one point five percent. But it wasn't a very broad uh, deceleration, and you could tell that because. Median CPI went down a little bit, decelerated a little bit, but not very much. And and as you know, I prefer to look at median because it kind of abstracts from those weird one-offs like airfares falling 8%. So that was two months ago. And then last month, we got another soft core print um, that was also a surprise. And part of the surprise was that airfares fell another 8%. And that back-to-back 8% fall we just hadn't seen, you know, since the collapse right around COVID. Um, and there was certainly no reason to think that airfares were going to plunge 8% and then plunge 8% again. Um, but unlike the prior month, it was a much broader uh, deceleration. Yes, you had the big one-off in uh, in airfares and you had used cars decelerating and you had, you know, uh, miscellaneous personal goods and recreation, new vehicles, housing furnishings, and operations, and a whole bunch of things that decelerated a little bit. And so, and so, median inflation actually dropped dropped quite substantially. But it still it still looked a little weird. I mean, the idea that all of a sudden, you know, we're out of the woods and prices just stopped going up seemed a little uh, unlikely. Um, and anyway, with a little bit of you know, if, if one or two things had swung the other way, then median would not have fallen. That's just the way a median works. Um, but there are lots of small changes, and that's a better thing. That's a better thing than having one or two small changes, or big changes that lead to a lower core. So, all right, so that was the backdrop. We had these two low numbers. Both of them were kind of 
one-off things, except for airfares, which I guess is a two-off thing. Um, you know, clearly better than what we'd had last year and earlier this year, but um, but still some suspicion. And so coming into this month, we we had that backdrop, and uh, and we also knew that headline was going to be a little bit perky because uh, energy prices last month started to to rise. Gasoline prices started to rise reasonably substantially. Um, and oh, by the way, with the Strategic Petroleum Reserve essentially empty um, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, there there weren't going to be any more games. And so when OPEC decided to restrict supplies a little bit, uh, we started to see gasoline prices go up. And so you knew that was going to to play into headline inflation. But that's headline inflation. And, and so we try to look past that. So what's going to happen on the core? So um, heading into the number, the expectation was that that um, you'd get something like uh, you know 0.23 or 0.24 on core. So you know, still rounding to 0.2, but a high 0.2. And part of that was when you were sort of penciling it together, you kind of go, well, all right, we got to have airfares are obviously got to bounce at some point, and um, but used cars are going to continue to drag and. Um, but you know, you sort of you know add these things up, and you 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 know but a, a big part of it was that you were going to get a bounce out of airfares, um, and uh, and in fact that's what happened. So Cork actually came in a little bit high uh, on the high side of, of 0.278 to three decimal places. Now, so that means it rounded to point three, and that's not nothing to get alarmed about. I mean, what we, we were seeing point sixes, point sevens, you know, those were things to get alarmed about. 0.278 is nothing to be alarmed about. It's yes, it's it's a little bit higher than we want uh, to see. Um, you know, it's it's in the mid threes if you annualize it, um, and you know, and everybody wants to see inflation go back in you know to the low twos. I don't think it's going to. I think we're going to end up in the high threes, low fours. But but this is the kind of number you you know you you'd like to see. You know, obviously some progress, and you'd like to see it more on the median. So. Um, the, the CPR, the CPI for used cars and trucks was less of a drag than I'd sort of expected going in. Um, airfares bounced a little bit less than 5%. That was a little less than I'd expected they'd bounce. So those two things kind of, you know, washed, you know, washed each other out. Um, and median inflation, and I think this is, is sort of the big point. So we'd gone from what, like 0.35% or 0.37% on median, and then, you know, three months ago it was 0.35, and then it dropped suddenly last month to 0.18, and then it, it's back up to like 0.33 this month. So median is gradually decelerating, but at 0.33% a month, um, you're talking about, you know, closer to 4% on an annualized basis. And that's, I think, where inflation kind of is, about 4%. But it is gradually accelerating. And the fact that median jumped back up tells you that the the broad deceleration that we had seen last month was also a little bit a little bit funny. Um, so where did it where did that really come from? Well, so there are, there are a couple of interesting things uh, to look at here. And um, one of the things that we have to be monitoring persistently going forward, and we always have to watch it, but um, it is housing. And there are, and I've, I've spoken before, we've had, I've had a podcast on, on, um, uh, on, on the fact that rents are decelerating. Um, and actually we had, uh, there was a podcast, uh, number 74 was inflation folk remedies and amongst, uh, and, and among the, Folk remedies I talked about. I I, I um, discussed some of the research that people have been doing that says that you know rent rent inflation should be negative, and that that's where it's going from where it currently is. You know seven seven percent and change. Um, that clearly is yet to be determined. I don't think there's any. Ch- I think it's going to around three ish. And it's currently in the, the rent of shelter, which includes um, which includes lodging away from home, and primary rent and owner's equivalent rent. 
the rent of shelter is 7.33%. So it's going to go down, but it's going to go down something to, to like 3%-ish. It's going to take time. So that's going to be a persistent deceleration. And every month we're going to pencil in a slightly lower uh, rent of shelter number. Um, and, and to the extent that it doesn't decelerate as much as people think, that means we're going to, to kind of persistently surprise, uh, you know, the average prognosticator out there because there are going to be more months when rent of shelter is a little high than, it, than, it, than months where it's a little bit low. Um, now this month we had primary rents at 0.48, owner's equivalent rent 0.38, um, and so you're in the mid point fours. However, you had lodging away from home again, again, coming down um, at and dragging 3% month on month. Um, I, I continue to be I don't know, skeptical. Um, I, I don't know how much of this is seasonal adjustment or what have you, but, you know, it, it seemed very, very silly when – when airfares were plunging, especially be, uh, when jet fuel prices were rising, but uh, to a lesser extent, but but I guess similarly, it, it's hard for me to believe that that you know hotel rooms are becoming suddenly cheaper. I mean, I'm certainly not seeing it, so um, it's less obvious than the really quirky thing with, with airfares. And again, to sort of review the whole airfares thing, again, it fell 8%, 8%. But airfares generally track pretty well over time to jet fuel. And it makes sense. It's the biggest input into in, you know, taking someone from point A to point B. The biggest marginal cost is the cost of jet fuel. And so when jet fuel goes up, airfares tend to go up. And what has been strange is that jet fuel prices have been stable to rising, you know, have been rising more this month, um, and yet you had airfares going down a lot, and that just didn't make a lot of sense. So coming into today, it seemed my estimation was that airfares were understated by about fifteen percent, and that's why I, I thought we would we would jump about six, and we got about five. Uh, but anyway, um, but sort of back to. You know, the, the whole shelter thing, you know, it's a little less obvious. It's a little hard, harder to tell what, you know, lodging away from home should be doing, especially because a lot more of lodging away from home are, you know, things like um, uh, Airbnb and, 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 and the like. And those are – it's very hard to sort of track that. So um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the uh, lodging away from home thing uh, makes some sense. But – Anyhow, that's all in shelter. Um, the um, and rent of shelter was uh, 0.29. So again, that sort of combines all three of those pieces of shelter. Looking at other categories, um, the CPI for medical um, medicinal drugs, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, was up 0.6 percent month on month. Um, and, and that's a series that just jumps all over the place. Um, but what is interesting is that, um, you know, back in 2020 and, and early 2021, um, pharmaceutical inflation was negative. And that just seemed bananas because we were in the middle of a pandemic and pharmaceutical prices are going down. That made very little sense. But, um, uh, but it turned out that it was just kind of laggy. And now we have had the last 10 numbers or so uh, from from medicinal drugs have all been positive. And on a um, – and so, you know, we're starting to get a, a reasonable – reasonably decent contribution from pharma. Um, it's less true from doctor services uh, – which were only up a tenth month on month and, and remains kind of soft, but hospital services was up 0.67% month on month. That also had been one of the soft categories last month, down 0.4. Um, and in the medical group, uh, it's, it's worth pointing out, I've been pointing it out now for 11 months, that 
one of the big persistent drags, and it shows up in core services, uh, X housing, you know, in super core, is this drag from health insurance. And, and we've talked about it before. The drag from health insurance comes from the way that health insurance inflation is imputed. Um, and, and I won't, won't go into it here, but it, it basically is an adjustment that the Bureau of Labor Statistics makes once a year and then sm- smears it out over 12 months. And this last year, it was a really, really large negative adjustment that never sort of made a lot of sense. And we knew that coming up, not next month, but the following month, we were going to see um, something of a snapback and health insurance will start adding to inflation going forward. Uh, The BLS has made a methodological change. Um, There's nothing sinister about this, but they're trying to make this a little more timely. And in order to make that change, the... um, the adjustment for the next 12 months that we were expecting, the persistent you know, jump, the, the persistent positive impact of two basis points or so a month, whereas now it's a drag of four basis points a month, um, is actually going to be accelerated and compressed into just the next six months after that. So we're going to go from dragging four, ten, uh, four basis points uh, on the overall core inflation to to adding about four basis points. So that's going to make a difference of almost a tenth, just not next month, but the month following that, just switching how we're doing uh, medical care inflation. So that's something to sort of keep in mind because everything that we're doing right now is, you know, this number itself um, is, was a little high. It was a little broader than than we had seen recently. Not alarming, but the question is, is it you know, is it or, or is the boat turning so that now we're going to see a series of, of numbers that we just don't like as much? Another place that we're going to see a you know, continued persistence in inflation. Um, so all the things which had been bringing down core inflation, you know, a lot of it having to do with core goods and things like that. A lot of them are sort of played out. Used cars could still fall a little bit, but but most of these things are kind of getting played out on the on the good side, and so the only big negative effect you have kind of going forward um, is is you've got um, housing gradually decelerating. The health insurance thing is going to reverse. Um, you know, lots of other things in core goods again sort of played out. You're starting to see pharmaceuticals go back up uh, more steadily, um, and and. And some of the things which are swimming in the other direction look like they've got staying power. One of those is uh, motor vehicle insurance. So uh, motor vehicle insurance, which was kind of obviously wild in 2020, has been persistently accelerating, not just rising, but accelerating um, each month and uh, was up 2.4% in this last month. And that's partly because there have been some natural disasters, you know, taking a lot of cars uh, away. But um, and and lead to a lot of uh, big settlements, but uh, but a lot of it has to do with carjacking and, and car theft, um, and um, uh, the sorry state of some of our, of our inner cities. And so, um, motor vehicle insurance over the last year is up nineteen percent, um, and uh, it's not an enormous part of CPI, but it's a very it, right now it's a very persistent ad, and so. Health insurance is going to become a very persistent ad. So on the one hand, you've got this housing, which is going to be decelerating, but we, but we are already seeing housing prices go back up. So eventually that deceleration is going to run its course. And we have these other things which are starting to become persistently on the positive side. Now, when you look at the diffusion, um, you know, so by diffusion, I mean, you know, Various ways of looking at how many categories are, are are accelerating versus decelerating, or or what have you. Those the the deceleration is still broadening, or the um, the acceleration is narrowing, depending on how you want to look at it. And so that's still good news, but it's still too broad to say that the inflation episode is over. The volatility of inflation is too high to suggest that the inflation episode is over. Um, and, um, uh, and like I said, everything to me looks like it's kind of heading towards around four ish, um, and that the wind is going to start blowing in the other direction here. Um, 
And, uh, and so the good news is going to stop being quite so good. Now, that doesn't mean that the Fed should be tightening uh, further. I think the Fed is, is done. Um, who knows? You never know when they want to throw in another quarter or whatever. But for all intents and purposes, the Fed is done tightening. They continue to shrink the balance sheet. Um, the problem is going to come uh, later this year or actually probably next year. And, and, and by the way, that's sort of the theme. I guess the theme is here that, that okay, we've had all this good news on inflation. And you know, it looks like the Fed is done and, and everything's worked out. And all those things have been great. And now they're all kind of facing uh, a change in, in, in the winds. And things are starting to blow the other way. Uh, I just talked about it, the inflation part itself. And on the Fed, you know, the Fed gets, okay, they were late. They, they responded poorly to COVID. They, they put way too much money in and they didn't recognize early enough how bad it was going to be in inflation. And it was easy to see. The Fed was very late to it and they don't, they deserve the chorus of boos that they got. Um, they deserve credit for when they did figure out that they were behind for jettisoning the, uh, the dovishness of the last 25 years and saying, hey, guys, we really need to not only hike rates, but we need to shrink the balance sheet. Um, and although it's been sort of a slow drip, they have been doing that. They've been very consistent about doing that. And I, I, I've been as surprised as anybody else in the world. Um, so, but they were, in both cases there, they were pushing in the direction that was sort of obvious. So they were, they were trying to, they were raising rates to pull down inflation, even though it doesn't really work that way. But, but that was the reason. But that was okay because growth was strong. And so the Fed hiking rates isn't a big problem. Um, it's easy to be a central banker when growth, the, the current state of growth and the current state of inflation argue for the same policy. The problem coming up is going to be that inflation is going to prove sticky, not at 7%, but at 4%. Um, and, and at the same time, um, we're going to start to see, I believe, interest rates out the curve start to or continue to rise. And that's going to, along with other things, slow the economy. So one of the reasons that rates are going to rise is that we keep uh, having larger and larger deficits. And one of the reasons we have larger and larger deficits is because the interest rate burden of the national debt is getting larger and larger because interest rates are going up. And um, and because um, we are actively trying to shrink our trade deficit, that means that we have, we're sending fewer dollars abroad for people to buy our debt. Net result is that the people buying our debt have to be more and more domestic, which means you need higher interest rates to persuade them to, to buy more treasuries. Anyway, that was a quick aside. That's why longer-term rates are going to continue to go up. And, so, and, and longer-term rates going up is going to um, you know, help decelerate other parts of the economy. And you've got other things like energy prices going back up and so on. And the Fed's not about to ease. But that's then the problem. Okay, so once the economy starts to slow, but inflation is still four, is the Fed still going to focus on prices? Are they still going to keep shrinking the balance sheet? Are they still going to maintain interest rates where they are? Or are they going to be forced to come in and start buying treasuries so that interest rates don't go to, you know, seven or eight? Right? Are they going to be forced to ease because the economy slips into a recession and all the doves come out again and say, well, you know, we don't have to worry about inflation because we're in a recession, even though it doesn't work that way. And so we should start easing again. That's going to be the real conundrum. And now that's not today's problem. That's next year's problem. Um, and that's what we're going to be, be watching going forward. But um, that, that's when it's not at all fun to be a central banker. And, uh, and we'll have to watch for that. For now, the, the, um, the easy part is over. Um, the, the, you know, the deceleration of inflation that came from, good, from 
from food and energy and from core goods um, has basically run its course. We're just about done with the health insurance thing. We still have the housing, but that's just going to trickle in over the next um, you know year or so. And after that, it's going to go back up. So um, the easy part here is, is is over. The easy comps, we have one more month that's uh, where we should see core fall just because we're dropping off a, a high number from last year. But then the easy comps are done, and so core is going to have more trouble going down. Um, the fourth quarter of this year is going to be more challenging from an inflation perspective. Um, not not like 2022, but it's going to be more challenging than most of uh, 2023 has been. So that's all for today, except for the answer to the trivia question. Um, I The question was, what supposedly results from playing the phrase number nine in the White Album's composition, Revolution 9, backwards? Uh, well, uh, the phrase, number nine, number nine, that's repeated a bunch of times, um, according to proponents of the belief that Paul McCartney of the Beatles had been killed in a car wreck, but that's, that the fact had been covered up um, in a conspiracy, supposedly, if you play number nine backwards, you get a clue because it it turns into, it becomes, turn me on, dead man. And that's one of the many clues to the truth that, McCartney was, in fact, um, no longer with the Beatles. If you want to Google that, there's an amazing amount of conspiracy uh, conspiracy theory stuff out there about Paul McCartney being dead. Um, and it's and I think the Beatles sort of leaned into it and and intentionally uh, placed some Easter eggs that um, you know got people even more excited. But anyhow, a little Beatles trivia Beatles trivia for you and. Um, And that, my friends, is all for today's podcast. Uh, Please subscribe. Please refer others. uh, And you can contact me at inflationguy at enduringinvestments.com. I've been getting some good ideas for for future broadcasts. Um, I do want to talk about um, what I've learned from used cars. That will happen soon. Subscribe for free to the blog at inflationguy.blog. And, of course, you can... Go to visit Enduring Investments if you have an inflation challenge. Tomorrow we're going to roll out a a new website. And most importantly, even more important than the website, defend your money. And if inflation is coming for you, remember, you know about it.